and other me mechanisms for enforcement. And so we're going to go step by step with each of these pieces of the framework. So first is creating that federal delineation through a new definition. Right now we have a broad definition for hemp. The Industrial Hemp Exemption Act will be creating a sub-definition for industrial hemp that specifies that a, a farmer under this definition would only be harvesting and growing material for stock, uh, fiber, and seed. Once a farmer uh, selects to grow only grain and fiber, they would make that designation on their application and that would indicate both to the farmer and to the Department of Agriculture that they are only allowed to harvest stock uh, fiber and seed material, and that they are restricted from harvesting any floral, floral or other material for cannabinoid production. And further, when a farmer would select being uh, part of this grain and fiber program, they would no longer be required to uh, undergo background checks. And we know that Broadly across the industry, there is a desire to remove the background check requirement from all farmers. Uh, I believe that's something that's likely going to be worked on in the 2023 Farm Bill. But for the hemp exemption purposes, this would apply just to those that actually make that designation on their application. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take a step back real quick for those of you who don't know me. Um, like Courtney said, my name is Morgan Tweet. And I come at this from a little different lens than Courtney and Erica. So my family has a manufacturing um, company up in Montana. And to date, we've managed over 20,000 acres for grain and fiber. And I really came to um, both of these ladies a year ago because this is uh, essentially, it's it's a, a need both for the industry, but really for the success of our business. I've had farmers that are loyal to um, our community, to our, our business, and they've come up to me and just said, I just can't do it anymore. You know, we've, we've jumped through all these hoops for four years now, and I'm just, I'm just over it. And so for us to be successful and really for us to see any of the opportunities that all of us in the industry are excited about with this crop, we've got to be able to open up this pathway. And so I've seen it really firsthand. Um, and it, to me, it's, it seems like it should be pretty simple. And so I really want to start with, these are three visually distinct crops. Um, I think with a little bit of training, um, I think that you can really prepare these individuals that will be inspecting the fields to pick up on some of these cues. And so we'll go into a little more detail about what they look like, but you know, to um, Courtney's point previously, we really want to try to open up the door. I think there's more opportunities in the future for us to even get further cutouts to make this easier and easier for growers. But for right now, we feel like how the exemption is framed and the language, it is the highest likelihood of success and easy for us to implement. Um, and state departments of agriculture should feel, feel very comfortable that we've looked at a lot of these things and we've talked with a lot of individuals trying to, um, like Erica said, let's identify all of the loopholes that could potentially be there. Um, and we really appreciate feedback. So hopefully you guys um, can reach out to us after this if we have any more questions that we didn't address. Um, so first we'll go to the grain crop. Go to the next slide. So uh, some things that you're going to look for if you're going on or you're going to see if you're looking for a grain crop. First of all, any crop, whether you're going for floral, grain or fiber, um, you know, obviously you're going to have to give that plant a little bit of time um, before you can go out in the inspection. So we anticipate that these visual inspections will happen later in the season pre-harvest. Um, so let's say mid-July time that you're going out there. Well, what you would see in a grain crop is first, um, really, it's going to be row crop style planting. So probably a grain drill um, is going to be used. You're going to see 200,000 to 500,000 plants per acre. Um, you're going to see both male and female plants out there. So if you haven't seen a hemp field before, um, that picture that we have on the left there, uh, you see the female flowers, and then you see these little yellow um, uh, plants out there, which are the pollen sacs of the male. Uh, if you're growing for grain, you want it to pollinate. You want these female flowers to, to use that male pollen and then convert and go into reproductive mode. It's very different for if you're trying to harvest that floral material. Um, there are some monoecious varieties that are out there, but you're still going to see those visual pollen sacs on both of the plants that have both sexes. If you do um, have concerns about floral material, um, we do know that it is already considered um, that combining or harvesting the seed is already already considered a um, remediation step. And that's because that floral material is not being collected when you're going through the combine. 
Now, I do know there are some specialized equipment that's out there that's potentially trying to harvest that floral material, but it's extremely specialized at this point and something that a Department of Ag would be able to identify um, that this grower is intentionally going out and harvesting that floral material. 99.9% .9 of the guys that are growing grain, they're going to have a direct cut um, combine header, maybe a stripper header. Some guys might go through with a swather and then come back with a pickup header. Um, but it's going to be pretty clear that this is using typical standard agricultural um, implements and practices. Next slide. So next is fiber. So similarly, like we got to give it a little time to get out of the ground, but it's going to, you're going to know pretty much right away if this is going um, to be a fiber plant because of that high planting population. So when we're growing for fiber, your, your intention is to, um, to harvest a stock material that is going to go both into the fiber or herd markets. And we want these plants to grow nice and tall, right? We want to go for biomass. We're trying to get three plus tons of the acre production. And that doesn't happen unless you have high planting densities. So now we're talking 800,000 to a million plants per acre. Um, obviously we, we're going for that height. So you're gonna see a height difference. Um, again, you'll see male and female. It is a little bit later, I would say, depending on your variety and your location. Um, you may not be able to see these as clearly um, because if you're going for highest vegetative um, mass, you want it to be in vegetative growth as long as possible. And so we really are seeing the varieties perform that delay that reproductive stage until later and later in season. And so um, depending on when the inspector goes out, they may not be able to see these um, pollen sacs, but I shouldn't, I shouldn't deter you that um, you should be able to make a designation um, or an inspection pretty easily. Again, there are some Monish's varieties. Uh, we do harvest it prior to seed maturity. Uh, at least most, most of the fiber guys are, um, unless you have a dual crop where you really are going for that true seed and fiber material. But even in that dual crop model, you are leaving flower material in the field. So you're not bringing anything off of that field that should be of concern. Um, and then on top of that, if you do have any intact flower material, we really have seen um, field reading is, is a very effective way to um, eliminate that flower material. So I would say pretty much most processors now are finding that the, the redding process is really critical for us to hit those higher value um, fiber products, as well as efficiencies within the manufacturing line. And so that redding process is essentially when we go into the field, we cut it as low as we can, we lay it down, um, and then you're going to let it do that natural decomposing um, where you want both heat, uh, moisture, and then time to start breaking down the pectins that are holding the fiber to the herb. So what we want is physically the breakdown of material. So if there's any leaf or flower material that you're concerned might be a compliant issue, just let it in the fields. Um, State of Montana has done a fantastic job of implementing this practice. You know, full transparency, we have had fields go hot in, in our growers, but we're very fortunate that our Department of Ag has um, recognize that field reading is a way to remediate. What we do is we test right before um, they bale. If it's too hot, we tell the farmer that they can't bale and we let it field red even longer. So for most of these guys that are growing, they have only one, one material that they're looking for, either the seed or the stock. And so you should be able to, um, to work with your growers within that designation to know what their intention is into the field. Um, next slide. And last um, is obviously cannabinoid um, growth. Hopefully you can see from that picture that right away it looks pretty different, right? We're seeing drip line irrigation, possibly in a greenhouse. Um, you're seeing a lot of weed control because we're planting these plants every four feet instead of um, you know, 200,000 plants per acre. You know, maybe we're down to 5,000 plants per acre. So visually, again, this is something you should be able to determine pretty quickly. Um, these cannabinoid uh, producers are going to be looking for large flower materials. So they do not want male plants in the field. They do not want it to be pollinated. Um, so again, it's one of those things that I think um, you should be as an as a inspector, you should be able to come to these determinations really quickly. And I also think that training is going to be um, you know, accessible and hopefully associations like National Hemp Association can, can assist with that and help people in understanding these differences. And then ultimately, you know, Oh, I think that there are some questions I've heard from people of, well, what about a, a dual crop or a tri-crop? We're trying to harvest these trichomes. 
no problem, right? If that is a legitimate um, business opportunity for you, we do not want to take that opportunity away from you. But if you are pulling flower material off of the field, you are not allowed to designate that you are under the grain and fiber exemption. So it's just strictly as you maintain the, cur the current regulations, your material has to be tested and has to be compliant before you can remove it from the field. So I hope that this doesn't um, limit people. We want uh, as many you know, innovative individuals coming out there and entering the market. But at the end of the day, if you're only removing seed or only removing stock, then you should have a different regulatory framework. Okay, so we talked about those in inspections. Hopefully you guys all feel pretty good about them. Um, so how we envision that this would work, and we've, like Courtney said, we've talked to USDA, um, we've talked with different um, select departments of agriculture. What, is, what does this concept look like? How do we implement it? And so I kind of want to give you guys a couple of um, examples. Initially, you will do your inspection. If you get to that inspection and something doesn't look right or you're concerned about it, then we go on to the next step. And so what we call for a failed visual inspection, then we have to go and verify our producer's intent. And what we think we can do that is additional uh, documentation, potentially seed tags, your FSA report, possibly a sales track, uh, contract. Hopefully you know before you put the seed in the ground where that product is going to be sold at. And then lastly, if we still don't feel like that's verifying the intent of the producer, we can, or the state can request for a harvest inspection. So let's be boots on the ground, Right there when you're harvesting, you can see what material they are planning to remove from the field. Um, if that point you still feel like you have a bad actor or someone who's trying to circumvent the program, then we can do a follow-up chemical analysis of um, the, the plant material that we're concerned about. So we're not going to sample the stock material. We already know that that's not classified and we're not going to sample the seed material. But if we feel like someone is out there growing flour and we're concerned that it's obviously in compliant, then we are gonna have a chemical analysis of that flower material. So we really wanna emphasize that we're gonna to try to find the intent of the producer first. Obviously the visual inspection should give us 95% assurance that they're doing what they're supposed to do. And then from there, we need to verify intent. If worst case scenario, we still think, then we still are allowing for that chemical analysis. And that was really um, coming from the state departments that we talked to that felt concerned about bad actors. So this is kind of our um, compromise in a sense to try and, and help and empower them to feel like they can manage this program. So my first example is the guy who's growing for fiber, who um, has no intention of growing any floral material, but he failed his visual inspection. So let's say he gets seed, has poor germination, um, he puts it in the field, and he only gets, instead of 800,000 plants per acre, he only gets, you know, 20,000 plants per acre. And, you know, it kind of looks like it might be a flower grow. There's just not very many plants out there. They're kind of bushy because like naturally the plant is going to fill out the space you give it. Um, and so he doesn't look like a typical fiber producer. And so what I would imagine happening is that inspector would come and um, they'd fail the, the visual inspection. So they'd start talking with that producer and say, okay, give me a sales contract. And you see from his sales contract that, He's working with the manufacturer and that he's going to be harvesting fiber or stock material at a price point of such and such per pound. Um, you also see from his seed tack that maybe it had bad germination. So you can put two to two together. He bought, you know, fiber genetics. It had bad germination and it just didn't come out. So here's an opportunity where a guy just had, you know, drew the short stick and um, was trying to do what was right, failed his visual inspection, but the State Department was still able to allow him to keep his designation because of these other things. At the end of the day, if the State Department is concerned about what he is doing and, and the flower material is there, they can be there at harvest and they can make sure that he is letting that crop ret in the field and that none of that material is coming off of the field until it is redded and baled. Now our second example. This is the guy that we're worried about who um, is going to see this as an opportunity to grow marijuana in the middle of this field. So you go out to the field, looks like it's a fiber field or a grain field. And then somehow we see through an aerial evaluation or something that in the middle of his field, there's a 10 by 10 foot plot that looks quite a bit different than the rest of the field, right? We see instead of, you know, 500,000 plants per acre, we see maybe four or five every five feet. And this is clearly someone who has done something very different and very intentional in the middle of his field. So at that time, you know, the inspector flags it. They don't like what they see. 
Um, that crop is detained, so he can't remove anything off of the field. And then that inspector can continue to investigate what was the intent of this change in production style. And if at the end of the day, we still can't prove that that farmer was doing what we think he was doing, well, let's, let's go and test that material. If, if that's a, a plot that's within the field that doesn't um, look right, failed all these things, then let's go, fit, let's go test that um, flower material that's in that plot. So in that instance, we have been able to, um, to enforce what we saw as the designation on their, um, their license. We were able to find that it was a bad actor who's trying to manipulate the system. And we were able then to, to catch that bad actor and then um, implement whatever those enforcement are within that state. So hopefully those are a couple of examples that you guys feel comfortable with. Again, we will be open to questions um, if it didn't. We do have a few questions that I feel like would be appropriate to address while we're still on this particular topic. Um, and the one question is, um, and I think you did touch on this a little bit, is that grain is inherently in floral material. So how can you restrict harvest of floral material when that's where the grain is found? Yeah, that is a good question. Maybe it's the way I, I phrased it, but um, I think it really goes back to when you combine the plant material, the, the mechanisms of the combine, if, if you're not familiar with how a combine works, it is physically going to be sifting that material out, right? So we'll cut the seed head. Um, it'll go through the thresher and then through the screens and any of that material, which we call foreign material that's connected or, or still intact with the seed at that point is going to go to the back of the combine. Um, and usually when throw it out the back. And so although you're absolutely right, there is inherently floral material that is intact within a grain seed. Um, we do, and, and USDA already considers this to be a, a type of remediation to harvest the seed. So hopefully that makes sense. Excellent. And then what does this exemption accomplish that isn't already possible through performance-based sampling other than the background checks? Yeah, so even in performance-based sampling, like we're very fortunate here in Montana, we're one of the states that do that. Um, we still have the risk of testing and we still have those requirements. So Montana still has to do background checks. Even my category A varieties, 10% um, of them are getting tested. So although the, that framework I think is a good step in the right direction, it's not ultimately alleviating the pain um, that our farmers are doing. And, and really maybe that's manageable at USDA, but we wanna do more than that, right? With this definition and being able to have a separation from floral production and ultimately floral products, then hopefully it opens up the doors for these other um, these other classes and these other problems we have. It was just at a, a grain growers um, conference this past week, ran into a gal that works for U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank still will not offer operating loans to people who are growing hemp, regardless if they're grain or fiber or for flower production. So we clearly still have some supply chain issues um, that we really feel like this designation is going to help us push through. Um, so although the, the performance-based sampling like I said, is a step in the right direction for how you manage them differently. It's not enough, right? We need that designation. We need the clear line in the industry so we can start managing them differently, both through the regulations and through throughout the supply chain. And I'll add to that also is that most jurisdictions are not taking advantage of performance-based sampling to benefit their producers. There's about a fifth of the states that have implemented performance-based sampling and only two tribes. And so while it's out there, it's not being utilized. And so the hemp exemption will help create that delineation and create that benefit for grain and fiber farmers across the nation. Yeah, I don't think a lot of states have been fully aware or understanding of what is and isn't possible through performance-based testing. Um, so the question about, is it recorded and be available after the seminar? It is being recorded now, but I did have to, I did miss the first like 10 minutes because I forgot. Um, so yes, we will be able to, to make information available afterwards. Um, and then this question is uh, somebody who logged on a little late and would like you to repeat what is the number of plants per acre for uh, CBD production? I think on the high end, maybe 5,000 plants per acre. It, it can be a lot lower than that too. Um, but for reference point, we you know we see grain varieties on the low end, maybe 15 to 20,000 plants per acre. And then on the fiber side, on the high end, we're even seeing up, upwards of a million plus plants per acre. So <clears throat> pretty, pretty different exponential difference there in, in seed population. Okay. 
And then two more, and then we're going to move on. Um, who would you see uh, doing these visual inspections? So I think that the State Departments and who the, who currently is managing the, the programs is the most logical um, the most logical answer for that. You know, we we are trying to give states still their jurisdiction. Like we don't want to necessarily be telling them what to do. We like to have that um, autonomy between states. Um, but those are that makes the most sense for those program managers to be also inspectors and how how they're currently delineating out sampling and testing procedures, probably along the same lines. And the last one before we move on um, is saying, please be aware that some producers will not field rent. It will dry to an acceptable level and then be harvested and stored. Will this be a problem? Yeah, I saw that question and um, I totally feel that because <laughs> I have some producers that field running is very challenging, right? Unfortunately, I had an early winter this year. And so um, a lot of my, my fiber is still in the field because we got snow um, early and it's still on the ground. So you're absolutely right. There is an opportunity that rutting may not happen, but what we'll get into a little bit later on is we actually, in the language, restrict any extraction of cannabinoids from that material. So worst case scenario, we don't get the field rutting. Farmer wants it off the field. They don't care hell or high water. It's coming off. Um, we do restrict that manufacturing process of um, extracting those, those cannabinoids. And so we want to make sure that the intent was never for it to be a cannabinoid product. Even if by, by happenstance there's flower material still there, it is illegal for us to, to, to concentrate or to remove that material out. Um, so at the, at the heart of this exemption, we really want it to be less burdensome for the farmers. And so maybe that changes the way manufacturers do things later down the road, but the, the farmer themselves should have the, the least amount of requirements for those burdens because at the end of the day, these are guys that are considering this to be a row crop. This is not their cash crop. They're probably putting it into rotation with wheat, with corn, with soy, with um, you know other specialty crops. This is not what they're focusing on. And so we want to try to make it as easy as possible so we can start seeing those benefits of what it's like to add hemp into the rotation. Okay, great. We have some more questions that I think will get answered as we move forward and we'll definitely have Q&A at the end. So I think at this time, we'll, we'll just continue with the standard presentation. So, yeah, I, I'm really glad that we were able to answer a lot of these questions that Morgan was able to go into some detail more about the different types of production, what they look like, and how we envision the inspection piece being carried out uh, by our regulators. And I, I saw one of the questions was, does this still require farmers to be licensed? Absolutely. And we have heard from you know, a lot of farmers that they don't want to have to get a license, but from an enforcement perspective and an, uh, an administrative perspective, we still need to require licensure so that our departments of agriculture and our law enforcement will know who is cultivating what and where. And so at this time, you know, until maybe we have a, a major uh, federal change in overall cannabis policy, we do need to maintain that licensing framework. And it is through that licensing framework that the farmer would be able to designate, I'm only growing grain and fiber. I have no intention of growing cannabinoids or uh, harvesting any, any flowers uh, for sale. And then that puts them in this framework of going through these visual inspections and not having to go through the background checks or through uh, sampling and testing unless there is a question as to the actual intent and type of production. And so when we're looking at the enforcement piece, the licensing is a critical piece. Um, that is what, what will be able to help farmer or help our law enforcement, our regulators delineate the different plots and, and who's actually cultivating, uh, you know, true industrial hemp or if they're cultivating cannabinoid hemp and also uh, to give the oversight for the mechanisms for the inspections and the enforcement piece. And while the exemption will apply across the board to all jurisdictions, whether it's a state, tribal jurisdiction, or a territory, we have included within the framework that each state, tribal jurisdiction, and territory will maintain their uh, regulatory authority to determine the severity of any civil or criminal penalties for anyone that is not in compliance. And so that flexibility is there. So different jurisdictions obviously have different uh, penalties for folks that are cultivating marijuana um, or violating their administrative programs. And so that flexibility is maintained uh, for each jurisdiction. 
And, you know, we want to signal to the broader industry and to any potential bad actors out there that this is really about creating an avenue for those traditional farmers that want to grow grain and fiber in rotation, that have no interest in cannabinoids, that are, you know, are not trying to be bad actors. And that's why we have such strict enforcement and, um, you know, the framework laid out as it is. And for anyone that violates the program one time, they are ineligible to participate in the program for five years. We got that five-year period from the current negligence threshold and the negligent violations within the 2018 Farm Bill, but we didn't give uh, folks a chance to be a bad actor three times or have a negligent violation three times, one time and you're out, because this is really about protecting compliant participants and not creating any avenue for any bad actors within this framework. So hopefully the, the pieces that we have talked about thus far have clarified and cleared up any confusion in regards to how the framework works and the thoughtfulness that we have put forward for the enforcement pieces. And so I will let Erica talk about where what is our overall vision with implementation of the hemp exemption. Oh, you're here on mute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I think as, as we've kind of said, like this whole thing, it really has the farmer at the heart of it and looking about how we can utilize hemp for all of its potential as a row crop, as a food source, as a sustainable product that can do all kinds of various things and also um, for environmental purposes. And this will go to reduce those barriers and make it easier for us to access new markets and create the supply chain, which has been the bottleneck that has been preventing us from really being able um, to, to get to scale. Everything is about scale. We know what hemp can do and we, we know how to get there. But as long as this perceived and real set of barriers is there, it's going to be really difficult to convince farmers to start doing this. And until we can demonstrate that the farmers are there and ready and willing to do this, the investment into the infrastructure for the processing is going to suffer as well. Um, so we've, you know, often labeled this as a chicken and the egg thing. Um, our chair, Jeff Whaling, is very fond of calling it a scrambled egg scenario. Um, but we need to do all of these things at one time. We need to keep supply and demand in check, and we need to reduce barriers, and we need to reduce costs. So while a lot of hemp products are able to be made now, by the nature, they're going to be more expensive than their counterparts until we can get to scale. Um, so these are just all some of the reasons why it's super important that we do this and that we do it now. Um, because now is the time, not only for domestic production, but it's also true that the rest of the world is looking to the United States to set the example of how this can be done and how it can be done well. Um, so those are, are some of the reasons why um, the time is now to do it and, and we're gonna do everything we can to, to make it happen that way. Um, so I get asked a lot as a processor what my concerns are for the current um, graph status of the hemp food and then possible animal feed pr approvals. So if you don't know, I'm also the executive director of the Hemp Feed Coalition. And so animal feed is, is near and dear to my heart and something I um, work on quite a bit. And so I truly believe that we're going to still continue to choose to grow low cannabinoid um, producing varieties because of these regulations. Um, if you look at the grass notices and you read them for, for hemp seed oil, for hemp protein, for hemp hearts, they clearly define what the limits are and why FDA didn't have any concerns from. At that time when it was submitted, it was just for THC. So um, we see that the varieties that are going to continue to be established and used in the hemp food space will have to meet these regulations. So as a hemp food processor myself, I'm going to choose to... Um, to work with producers who are using those varieties that I know can meet these thresholds. Um, I think it's kind of a misconception that this exemption just wants to like 
throw the, the compliance values out the window. It's absolutely not the case, right? The, the consumer is going to drive um, these numbers. And, and especially when we have regulators that are, are setting thresholds, then that's going to drive the market as well. And, and the same concept is absolutely going to be applicable to animal feed. Um, when we get the application for laying hens approved, um, which HFC has been working on for two years, we had to define a contaminant level for THC and CBD. So regardless of what I personally think, um, these regulations are already recognized. And, and we do believe that um, with good manufacturing practices and new technologies, you know, this will continue to change and we'll continue to find efficiencies within the process. But at the heart of this exemption, it, it again goes back to the farmer. They shouldn't have to worry about those burdens, right? The manufacturer, that's my problem. It's my problem that my customer has a limit for CBD and my hemp seed oil. It, do, it should not matter to my grower. So as a, as a processor, I will continue to work with um, seed companies that have good genetics. And when I say good genetics, I don't want that to mean compliant genetics. I want genetics that are going to perform because of their oil content or their drought resistance or their yield, right? Things that are already established in agriculture. I want those breeding companies to be working on. And I know they are. I know that we have some really great varieties that are out there coming out um, and that we're working on. But at the end of the day, right now, we still have to worry about compliance because that's what's driving the narrative. And so I don't think that this campaign will have any effect on grass status. And I don't think it will have any effect on animal feed approvals um, because we will define as an industry, what are those thresholds? Um, and regulators will set the bar of what they think is, is legal in consumption and we will have to meet that. And so that's gonna be the industry's problem, not the farmer's problem. And one thing I would add is that we are hopeful that creating the delineation will help ease conversations so that when we're talking about grain and we're talking about fiber, all of a sudden the conversation isn't jumping to Delta 8, for example. That when we're having these conversations, whether it's regulators, whether it's bankers, whether it's folks that we're trying to engage with advertising with, that there isn't this conflation or this confusion between the different sectors anymore. And that there really is an understanding that when we're talking about grain, we're talking about grain, we're talking about food. And, you know, and something that, that Morgan just touched on um, is, is, and the question that we've heard often is the question about certified seed. And I think it's important to say from the get-go, we absolutely support and encourage people to look at certified seed. It is super important, not only in the hemp industry, but literally every other area of agriculture. Certified seed has germination rates, you know, good germination rates. It has stable genetics. It has, you know, cleanliness. It, it has all of these things going for it. But the, but the reality is that we, we don't have enough of them that have been tested in every area. And there is no other area in agriculture, at least not that I'm aware of, that certified seed is mandated by law um, or even provided special considerations. So um, there are things that can be done now under the, the performance-based sampling protocols that can encourage further the use of certified seed. And we, we also see that, you know, there'll be additional rulemaking that, that can, can possibly address that. Um, but right now, we, we need to focus on separating the idea that compliance and performance are the same thing. Um, so again, just to, to specify, like we, we absolutely support certified seed. There's going to be reasons why, you know, some of what Morgan just touched on with those, you know, considerations on the manufacturing side. Um, but that's, that's where the decision to be made about whether or not somebody purchases certified seed should come from. It should be a contractual issue between the farmer and his his manufacturer um, as to what's going to perform best based on what the needs of that manufacturer are. And then, so the reasons why we have concerns for this, and it, it's 
you know, certified seed does not always mean compliant. We have seen certified seed exceed THC levels. We've also seen them not necessarily have the same yields. Um, we do need to try these varietals out in various parts of the country because what grows well in Montana might not grow well in Alabama. Um, we also want to make sure that we maintain a free market approach, like certified seed should be able to be sold and purchased because it is legitimately better. And oftentimes it will be better, um, but it shouldn't be part of any kind of regulatory framework that insists that it be purchased in order to get the special exemption. There's been several universities that have been compiling data for a good four years now, and there are just as many varietals that are not certified that have proven to be compliant as, as there are certified seed. So it's, it's not a question that certified seed is not good. It, of course, is. It just has nothing to do with compliance. It should have nothing to do with compliance. Um, and then the, the big elephant in the room is, is that if you were allow certified seed to provide an exemption for, for cannabinoid hemp, it creates an exploitable loophole that you really can't get around. Um, if you're going to grow cannabinoid hemp and you're exempt from um, testing, there's not going to be anything that stops somebody from purchasing certified seed and then doing whatever they want. Um, because there'd be no visual inspection, there'd be no chemical inspection. Um, so it, it really kind of creates the problem that the some of the regulators that we've heard from are actually concerned about, which is how do you prevent bad actors? So that's why we've put so much thought and emphasis into our enforcement piece um, and making sure that what we're asking for does not create exploitable loopholes for, for bad actors to thrive in. Thank you so much for explaining all that, Erica. Um, and I do just want to point out that, um, you know, there are additional exemptions available for certified seed currently with performance-based sampling. And also that through rulemaking, through the hemp exemption, additional uh, exemptions could be advocated for for certified seed. And so we, we, again, we do fully support the use of certified seed that is performing and helping our farmers grow and meeting manufacturer spe uh, specs. Um, backwards here. So what is the status of, um, oh, there we go. Okay. What is the status of the Industrial Hemp Exemption Act? So the bill is drafted. Uh, we have bipartisan Senate champions. As we've discussed, this framework has been vetted through the Senate A Committee with USDA, select departments of agriculture, and numerous industry stakeholders throughout the country. We are in preparations for introduction, uh, given that we're at the end of this Congress, we are looking to introduce in the next Congress. And this is a standalone bill with aims to insert into the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is an incredible opportunity for overall reform and uh, progress for hemp policy. And so we believe that this is a critical next step for specifically the grain and fiber sectors. And that is our goal to include it in the upcoming Farm Bill. And so with that, we would like to uh, continue answering any questions that anyone has. Okay, I think we will start at the beginning and, and do the, the ones ask and we'll just go down and, and tackle them in order if that makes sense. Um, so the first question is, where does the Farm Bureau stand on this issue? Um, I don't specifically know where we're at with Farm Bureau. We, we, we're continuing to work on finding those, those other partners and champions. By and large, though, when I talk to insurance companies, you know, baking um, organizations, things like that, they are desperate for something like this. They want to manage them separately. Um, you know, insurance is probably number two on my list after the exemption for things that have to happen in the next 12 to 24 months. And so um, there are definitely a lot of good feedback from those people who are, you know, staples in agriculture who are dying for grain and fiber to be able to have their own framework to be managed in separately. So we all live in the hemp space. We have our blinders on. We eat and breathe this every day, at least most of us. And, and so um, we don't always remember that there's people who look to us for some insight in that. They don't, they don't have the opportunity or the bandwidth to fight the good fight. 
but they want us to bring them something that they can work in their existing um, structures and organizations. So uh, we believe that we're going to have really strong support across multiple agricultural um, platforms like Farm Bureau. Excellent. Um, so this one, I think this is more of a comment, but um, in Texas, if plants test above 0.3%, producers may A, trim the plants until the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol concentration of the plants is not more than 0.3% on a dryway basis and dispose of the non-compliant parts, or B, process the plants into fiber with Delta-9 of not more than 0.3%. Um, in a matter approved by department. So yes, that is true. And that is, you know, so currently your remediation option is to do just that, just harvest the seed, just harvest the stock material, which have always been exempted. So if that's what you're intending to do in the first place, why go through all of the cost and the expense and the time um, of doing compliance testing and background checks in the first place? Um, Courtney mentioned that a fifth of the states are taking advantage of performance-based sampling. Why would this exemption be different? So the difference with the Industrial Hemp Exemption Act framework is that this will apply across the board. And so this will be creating that new delineation, this new regula regulatory framework that will apply to every jurisdiction. Whereas with performance-based sampling, it's only an option under the USDA final rules. And so because this will apply across the board, as I mentioned earlier, we do still leave the discretion up to states, tribal jurisdictions, and territories as to the level of enforcement, whether it's civil penalties, criminal penalties, or both for any noncompliance. And I will also say, you know, the performance-based sampling, it's a great um, foot in the door, but quite frankly, it's pretty limiting as well. If we're to, when we're looking at like new genetics, and when you look at any other crop, you know, they're bringing out varieties every year, right? Breeding programs are super robust. And for every variety to have to start at ground zero, you know, a category C or category D, because it hasn't previously been grown and have to go through that rigorous, um, you know, performance, I, I, that's just super limiting to our industry. And we're not going to see um, breeding companies be competitive because there's going to be these additional costs. And so we're not going to have more varieties out there that are specialized to the per, to the regions or how they're performing um, for all those characteristics we talked about earlier, because performance-based sampling doesn't do it quick enough and it doesn't do it broadly enough. And so this is really, um, we need the next step. Yeah. And this is just another step closer to the, the level playing field that we all hoped that we would get with the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill that has not come to pass yet. So having a, a kind of standard set of, of rules and regulations that everybody's operating under um, is going to make life a lot better and easier for everybody. Okay, uh, next question. In the example of the U.S. bank not financing grain and fiber that Morgan mentioned, if they were to finance a bad actor under this framework, would they be at risk? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that that's a reality that um, we're going to see as, as uh, inspectors and, and they implement this program and we get more of these, um, this, these other programs, you know, like banking and insurance behind it that we're going to have to kind of walk before we run. Um, and so by and large, you're probably still going to see banks that continue to, to tread lightly um, while the, the framework is continuing to be implemented and they're going to need to get historical data. The reality is a lot of banks tread really lightly with, with ag company or uh, customers anyways. And so if it's a new person, they're not going to give them, you know, a million and a half operating loan just off of day one. They have to prove that they're, they're good customers of the bank as well. And so I think that the reality is, is if someone is going to put their, their banking relationship, their operation, all these things at risk because they want to grow a few pot plants in the middle of their field, well, that idiot doesn't need a, you know, a $1.5 million operating loan to begin with. Um, and so is it going to, you know, day one change things? Most likely not, but I think it allows um, banks to have the framework for them to start looking at this differently. Excellent. Um, and I would add to right under current policy, it's, it's up to the bank to do their due diligence on the person that they're banking with. And so this exemption is not going to change that in any capacity. Okay, just trying to scan through here. Somebody commented that USDA extended DEA, yeah, DEA lab registration exemption through 2023. OK. 
Okay. What levels of THC have you seen in grain from your experience? So the varieties that I've grown um, that we, you know, are, have been bred up in Canada for the last 20 years, they're well-established genetics. And so most of the time, if any of my growers were picked to be, um, to be sampled and tested, we saw non-detectable limits, right? Or, or very low 0.1, um, you know, maybe less than that. So, so we're not seeing levels of THC in the grain varieties. If you look at the USDA current program and how they um, instruct those samplers to take the, the sample, I also think it's a little construed because to someone's point earlier, there is still flower material that's holding on. So that's where those trichomes are. By and large, when you take a sample of a grain, um, a grain head though, the major concentration of that material is seed. We know biologically that we're not um, creating cannabinoids within the seed themselves. So, so when you blend that sample all together and, and get a composite sample, the higher concentration of seed is going to outweigh any floral material that is there. I think if you were to just take the seed and individually, you know, test for cannabinoids or THC in the seed, you wouldn't, you it'd be very low levels, um, non-detectable levels of THC. Okay. Um, sorry, my eyes are getting buggy here. Um, is the draft language available for review? So the draft language is not yet available for review. Once we are able to share that publicly, we will gladly share that publicly. Can you please reiterate what were the additional exemptions for known producers using certified seed varieties? So just like with performance-based sampling, none of that rulemaking authority is changed through the hemp exemption. And so uh, any certified seed companies or other folks that want to advocate for further exemptions for certified seed, we are happy to work with them to create those uh, delineations. Uh, do you feel there is more work to be done in the Senate or the House? What issues benefits do you see with the new Republican controlled House? Um, I feel like hemp is one of these rare things that actually enjoys bipartisan support, um, which we're eternally grateful for. Um, so I, I think the, the only issue with the Republican controlled House is there may be some delays in the implementation of the farm bill because the House controls the farm bill this year. And because the, the control is shifting, um, the Republicans will likely take some extra time to review the work that has already been done to make sure that it meets their priorities. So there may be some delays there, but I personally don't think there's any issues as far as getting this introduced or passed that is based on who controls which chamber um, because we we have enjoyed bipartisan support for this issue. So I don't know, Courtney, would you have like to add anything to that? No, I think you're hundred percent on point. Hemp has been bipartisan and we are working, the bill's bipartisan and we are working with offices on, on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers. Okay, can you share thoughts on why licensing would still be needed instead of a field or crop registration? Maryland is approximately $500 per numerical address for a license, and this could still be a huge obstacle to overcome due to high costs for farmers who lease thousands of acres with different addresses. Yeah, Ernie, 100%. Um... The reason that we have to still have licenses is because of the enforcement piece and making sure that law enforcement, our regulators know who is cultivating what where. And from my experience working with different departments of agriculture, a license versus a registration has really just been a difference in nomenclature and it really hasn't been any difference for the department. And so we would encourage different departments to charge lower fees if they wanted to for grain and fiber producers to help encourage them to participate within the program. Yeah, we, we really can't speak to, at least this, this campaign and the bill language can't speak to the financial implications. We believe that there logically should be a reduction and we should see some of that burden 
um, be removed, but every state's different. And obviously we're trying to get something at a federal level. And, and, you know, like in Montana, we may not have to sample, but I still have a large geographic area to cover and, and to go out and visually inspect. We may not be able to see reductions in costs and things like that. So um, it, I do think that we, we have a hope for the future, maybe the next coming farm bill when people realize that grain and fiber people really are trying to do the right thing. And they're just like any other farmer with a different crop. Um, maybe we find that FSA reports are, are really what we can we can look to. But unfortunately, we, we can't really go that far right now because we need to get something that's in the right direction. Will this legislation include exemptions for hemp greens and microgreens? So that's a great question. I don't think there's enough in the industry right now for us to speak to it. We did talk about it quite a bit. Um, I, I think you know you can follow the logic here again. Um, of, of where are we finding those trichomes? What is the most, you know, what's the risk of that crop? And, and there's just not enough research to support um, a, a confident decision one way or another. Um, I don't know personally, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough people who can speak to when the trichomes, you know, are apparent and where we have a, a potential to see a higher risk of an incompliant material coming off of that. Um, but I definitely think if that's an industry that's continued to grow, then we should, you know, continue to partner and look at opportunities to include it in, in exemptions like this. Can you give a few examples of U.S. industries specifically waiting for this, i.e. hempcrete, hemp wood, or just edibles? Yeah, I mean, this is this is really necessary in us to grow any of these industries. So the reality of a lot of those products you just shared are, are pretty low margin products. And, and so that means we need a low cost of goods sold in order for that business to be viable. And how do you get low of cost goods sold? You get you have to have a low raw material. And, and so if you look at just what the farm economics are um, for what the value of stock material is or seed material, and then you add on these additional burdens with, within the current framework, um, you know, that number continues to get smaller and smaller. And so we need to open up these things so we can get a lower cost of goods so that we can capitalize more on these margins while we're building these higher value products you know, which require more technology, they require more infrastructure. Um, and so that's really just kind of continuing to reduce the denominator to make this a little bit easier so the industry as a whole can grow. Hope that answered the question. Okay, well, we are actually a little bit over time. Um, so do would either of you ladies like to make any final comments? Um, I think that there was a lot of questions still about genetics and certified, and, and I think it's a good conversation to have. Um, one thing that we didn't quite point out, though, is, you know, we we need those, or we pointed out to, but um, maybe didn't hit home, is we need these varieties that perform. And, you know, the Global Hemp Association um, endeavored to, to find out what those varieties were that were performing, and they did 10 locations. Um, a lot of great people were involved in this project. And, and I know that there's just some preliminary work that's out right now, but what we're finding is some of these varieties that are not certified that may possibly go hot, right, maybe 0.4%, um, they're actually putting on the biomass that these farmers need. And so I know that it's somewhat scary for people to consider, but if we are not removing floral material off of the field, do we really concern ourselves with these varieties that have the potential to go hot? when we're really trying to focus on what brings that farm economics back into sync, what do these farmers need to see for production? Um, so I'm really thankful for, you know, the, the variety trials that, you know, Global Hip Association put together. I know University of Kentucky coordinated with several different extensions um, offices. I think there was like 12 different locations across the U.S. They looked at germination. They looked at, um, uh, they looked at the THC content. They looked at the biomass material. And so, we do have statistics now that are pointing to us uh, or pointing us towards varieties that may not necessarily you know, qualify as certified right now, but are performing. And, and it goes back to, you know, we need to start being recognized at a, as a traditional row crop and we need varieties that get us there and um, opening up that door for us to consider them a little bit differently and manage them differently is, is really important for that to happen. Yeah, and I want to add too is that you know we're we're really 
really trying to create an opportunity for expansion of the grain and fiber sectors and for them to really be regulated as close to traditional agriculture as we can at this time, given the other concerns and, and the federal status of marijuana at this time. And so um, I saw a, a question just popped up, you know, have we seen opposition from the medical or recreational marijuana industry from this bill? Absolutely not. Every uh, cannabis association I've talked to is fully supportive of this. And they also want to see an opportunity for grain and fiber to thrive. And so I hope from you know, an industry perspective, but also from a regulator perspective, you can see that with the framework that we've put in place, that we are doing everything that we can to address your concerns, ensure that there are no bad actors that would even attempt to be part of this program, and that if they do, that there are strict enforcement measures in place. And that each jurisdiction, again, will have that flexibility for the type of enforcement, whether it's civil or criminal, for anyone that would attempt to try to violate this program. And so if anyone has additional questions, please reach out to us. Uh, you can contact us through the website. Um, you can let us know if, if you're new to this and you want to become a supporter, we'd love to list you on our website. If you have questions that you need answered, please reach out to us. We are encouraging an open dialogue. You know, the more that we've heard from folks is how we've actually made changes and modified the bill text itself and the overall framework. And so we want to ensure that this is a framework that is going to work for everyone, that it's going to help our farmers, that it's going to alleviate questions that are being uh, pushed forward to our manufacturers and also help our regulators actually streamline the work that they're having to do in the oversight. Definitely. Um, Earl, thank you, ladies, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we will, um, if you, like Courtney said, if you have additional questions, reach out. We have an open door here. We want to hear from you, and we want to address everybody's concerns as best we can. Um, when we do have draft legislation that we can share, we will reach out, like particularly to the regulators that we have on the line. Uh, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to see it and be comfortable. Um, we may do another one of these a little later on when we when we have some more movement um, to address any further questions. And um, again, thank you all for joining us. We hope that you uh, found this uh, informative and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you.